God has set an appointment with destiny for man in this last generation? Will our leaders' decisions in this decade lead to disaster or peace? Join us in exploring such topics as the Ark of the Covenant, Israel's Third Temple, and the Promise of Heaven. Author and teacher Grant Jeffrey has written several best-selling books on Bible prophecy, Armageddon, Appointment with Destiny, and Heaven, The Last Frontier. Appointment with Destiny will challenge your thinking about Bible prophecy and the exciting events of this decade. Welcome to Appointment with Destiny. I'm your host, Grant Jeffrey, and I'd like to share my years of research with you on Bible prophecy, world history, archaeology, and the rapidly unfolding events that are leading us towards our appointment with destiny. Our topic today's program will be Russia's appointment with destiny. Thousands of years ago, the Bible described in detailed prophecy that there would be a coalition, a confederacy of nations to the north of Israel, which would attack her suddenly without warning in the last days. I want to read with you the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 37. He described that in the last days, Israel would come back from the captivity where Israel had been in the graveyard of the nations really over thousands of years. Ezekiel himself was the prophet of the exile. He lived in Babylon. He'd been taken there from Jerusalem. And he lived in the captivity and was asking God, when would the captivity end? God described and prophesied literally to the smallest detail, including the very day, May 15, 1948, when Israel would be reborn, as I will share with you on another program. But in his great prophecy, chapter 37, the vision of the valley of dry bones, the prophet Ezekiel asked God, as he was taken out into a valley full of dry bones that represented Israel in the graveyard of the nations, he asked God, can these bones live? God went on and described to him that in the last days he would take Israel back from the valley of death and would cause her to rise up. God said, I will lay sinews upon you. This is Ezekiel 37 verse 6. And I will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. God says he's going to physically revive Israel from death and that he will spiritually revive it as well. He went on in verse 11, And God said unto him, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost, for we are cut off for our parts. And God went on and said, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Israel was reborn on May 15, 1948. That event shook embassies around the world as Israel once more took its place on the stage of world history. God said not only would he revive her physically, but that when he did that, he said, I will make you one nation on the mountains of Israel, in verse 22. They shall no more be two nations. And so the ancient division of the ten tribes and the two would be removed forever. And God said that as one nation, they would exist in Israel. And when that happened, God said a strange alliance of nations would gather against Israel and come down and attack her. God had described that in verse 10 of chapter 37 that when the breath comes into them and they live, they will stand up upon their feet as an exceeding and mighty army. Israel's now the most military powerful nation in the world next to the United States and Russia. God describes the list of nations that will come against Israel. In chapter 38, God says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog. This is the man, the leader of Russia. The land of Magog. Magog is Russia. He's called the chief prince of Meshek and Tubal. Now, Meshek is Moscow, and Tubal is Toblesk. And God said, Prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshek and Tubal. He describes that he's going to turn them back and put hooks into thy jaws and bring them forth with a mighty army. 
Now, God then lists the nations, and we have a list here of the nations. Now, Ezekiel didn't describe the modern na nations. He described them as the ancient nations of Persia, which we know, and we, as we look at a map, we can see that the ancient nation of Persia, in fact, is occupied by Iran, Afghanistan, and Iraq. And so he named Persia, and we know then that these nations will ally themselves with Russia. He lists them Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togomarath of the north quarters, and all of his bands, and many peoples with thee. I want you to notice something here. In that map, we see that in Genesis 10, that God said that the children of Noah, his children, his grandchildren, would settle, Gog, Magog, Gomer, Togomarath, would settle into these various areas that we see on this map. By describing where these individuals settled, we then are, have the Bible clearly tell us the modern nation of Russia, the modern nation of Ashkenaz, which is Germany and Poland, the area of Gomar and Togomarath, and so we have the area of the Ukraine and Turkey. These nations are all listed that will attack Russia in the la attack with Russia and attack Israel in the last days. In chapter 38, verse 7, God tells Russia that she is going to be the armor unto these nations. It says, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou an armorer or a guard unto them. Now, Russia is to be the leader, and Russia today is allied with every one of those nations that was described 25 centuries ago. Russia is, in fact, the armorer. Every one of those nations on that list and in that map is armed by Soviet AK-47 Kalashnikov assault rifles. They're armed in Soviet uniforms, Soviet military equipment of all kinds, planes, surface-to-air missiles. God said that these nations would ally themselves together, armed and led by Russia. And God says in verse 8, After many days thou shalt be visited. And God is talking prophetically to Gog, the leader of Russia. I believe that this leader is alive today. Now, whether or not it is the current leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, or his replacement, I can tell you this. The Bible says in a very personal way that the leader of Russia will be inspired by God to attack Israel, that God says he has an appointment with Russia and her allied nations in the last days. Now, why would that be? If you look back in history in the last 73 years, you will find that Russia has persecuted millions of Jews, millions of born-again Christians of all the different denominations in Russia. And God does not forget. He has an appointment with destiny with Russia, and God says that she will be visited in the last years. God says that Russia, out of a desire to attack Israel, to gain that geostrategic uh, importance of capturing the, that land bridge between the three continents, God says that when Israel is gathered out of many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, we saw that happen in 1948, the rebirth of Israel. They came back from 71 countries into the land. God says that when those people are brought back into the land that has been always laid waste, God says they will dwell safely. And then God says, Russia and her allies, with many peoples with thee, will ascend and come like a storm. In the map, we can see that this Russian invasion will come from Libya. It will come from the area of Iran. It will come from the area of uh, Russia itself. All of these nations will ally themselves together in a lightning attack. I find it fascinating that Russia has joined in recently with the United Nations in the second time in history they moved to the United Nations all the way to Geneva to hear the terrorist leader of the PLO, Yasser Arafat, and when that occurred, they met and declared that the United Nations should send troops into Israel to enforce the decrees and resolutions of the United Nations. This could well be the opening wedge. This could be the thing that Russia and these nations will, under a United Nations flag, possibly cause this battle to take place. I've always wondered why. It says that Russia would have all these allies and many peoples with thee. Why would Russia not simply do it with 10 or 12 divisions of their own? God has an appointment with Russia and the Arab nations and the leadership, and God will sanctify himself in the sight of many nations when this battle is completed. 
The Bible tells us that they shall ascend and come like a storm, and they shall be like a cloud to cover the land, and all of thy bands and many peoples with thee. We keep coming back that Russia will not be only on its own, but many peoples with thee. We are watching today the uh, unfolding of a situation where Russia is literally breaking up. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is breaking up before our very eyes. Even the, uh, the Federal Republic of Russia itself, the major province, wishes to break off. And so when God says, many peoples with thee, I believe it is prophetically foreshadowing the fact that Russia is going to break up into various parts, but Russia will lead these parts and these nations, these tribes, in a lightning attack in Israel in the last days. We'll come back in a minute and talk about the outcome of this battle. Are we about to face an appointment with destiny called Armageddon? A remarkable phenomenon of fulfilled prophecies reveals that Israel's major events have occurred on biblical anniversaries, such as Passover or Pentecost. In Jerusalem, the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians on the ninth day of Av. The second temple was burned by the Romans on the very same date. Will Israel rebuild a third temple as the Bible predicts? 3,000 years ago, King Solomon brought the Holy Ark of the Covenant up into the Temple Mount. This Holy Ark was the most important sacred object in history, and yet it disappeared during the reign of King Solomon. Many scholars believe that directly behind the Eastern Gate is the original place of the ancient temple. Where is the lost Ark of the Covenant? Is it hidden in an underground temple in Ethiopia? What role will the Ark play in the coming of the Messiah? This fascinating bestseller contains many new discoveries, including the Bible's predictions of Israel's rebirth and the coming Russian invasion. Just how close are we to the final battle of Armageddon? To order Armageddon Appointment with Destiny, send your check for $15, including shipping, to Frontier Research, Box 470470, -470 Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147, or call 800-621-9014 to order by Visa or Master Charge. Twenty-five centuries ago, the prophet Ezekiel described that Russia would lead this attack against Israel at a time when people were not looking for tension, but rather were looking at peace. It says that in the day when my people of Israel dwell as safely, shall thou not know it, Gog? And so God says that Gog, whoever this leader of Russia is, he will be a man who will recognize that Israel is dwelling safely, thinking that there is a time of peace. And so today, with all of the peace motions and the move in peace in Europe and in Russia, people are thinking that peace has arisen. But the truth is, the Bible tells us that there will not be a real peace until the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, shall come. And that it says that at a time of apparent peace, of false peace, then sudden destruction will come. Some people would find it difficult to believe that with the situation today, with Gorbachev and the Russian republics beginning to separate, that Russia could really mount an attack. But let me tell you something, that the method of Russia has been always to deceive the West, and five times since 1917, Russia has entered a period of detente and a uh, thawing of the Cold War, have asked for Western credits and technology. And so we must always keep on our guard. We must rejoice as we do in the freedom that is coming within Eastern Europe and pray that it comes within the Soviet Union. We need to take advantage and get Bibles into Russia and into Eastern Europe and help them as we can and pray for them. But we also must be aware that this is precisely the scenario God described 25 centuries ago that Israel would dwell at peace and then the leader of Russia would suddenly attack them. It says that this man will have a thought come into his mind, let us go up to the land of unwalled villages, let us go to those that dwell at peace and attack them. Now notice Ezekiel says the land of unwalled villages. You see, Ezekiel had never seen a village, let alone a city, without walls. Walls, uh, city walls, very high ones, were the basic method of defense 25 centuries ago. In fact, right up until 1900. But we now dwell in a civilization since 1900 that walls have no value for defense with bombs and missiles. Walls are not necessary. And in fact, in Israel, she dwells without walls around all her villages and cities, save for the old city of Jerusalem. 
God said it would happen. In 1982, Russia did a test run on this attack because in Lebanon, in the 82 incursion, when Israel went into Lebanon, she discovered under Beirut hollowed out tunnels under the mountains around Beirut, tunnels that held 500,000 AK-47 assault rifles, Russian uniforms, 500,000 of them unmarked. She found K-rations there with only a shelf life of six months. This was in June of 1982. Russia had moved in this equipment secretly into tunnels underneath and around the city, controlled by the PLO, and they found documentation that what was going to happen would be an Arab attack on Israel. They would request volunteers from the communist countries, and these volunteers, quote-unquote, uh, civilian-clothed military people would have got on planes, barreled into Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, picked up the prepositioned weapons, and attacked Israel. Israel captured those weapons, and Israel now, interestingly, is the second largest exporter of used Soviet equipment in the world because she already has enough American and Israeli weapons to satisfy the needs of her citizen army, so she is selling around the world the weapons, over half a million of them that were captured, millions and millions of rounds of ammunition. God said it would happen. In 1982, Russia was ready to come down within six months. But because Israel knocked out their planning, Russia has had to postpone that planning, and it is now postponed until another time in the future. I believe that time is rapidly approaching. God said, it shall come to pass in verse 18 of chapter 38, at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. God says that he is going to devastate that army. Now God describes that the response of the allies of Israel will not be to militarily help them. It is not going to be the United States or Britain or Canada that responds and helps Israel this time. It is going to be God himself that intervenes miraculously as he did in the days of Moses in order to save Israel. God says that the reaction of the world will be a diplomatic protest. He says in verse 13 that Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions thereof, shall say unto Russia, Art thou come to take a spoil? In other words, they're simply going to protest. Tarshish was Britain, and the young lions thereof, I believe, prophetically refers to the dominions, including Canada, all the old Commonwealth nations, including America, that was derived from the British Empire. God says that they're going to respond only with a diplomatic protest. But God has an appointment with Russia upon the mountains of Israel. And there he will meet Russia and deal with Russia and those Arab nations that have come to destroy Israel at a time they are miraculously coming back into the land to fulfill prophecy. What will be the military outcome of this great world war? It's going to be condensed into a very short period of time. The Bible seems to describe it almost as a six-day war, just as Israel conquered Jerusalem in 1967. It will involve many nations allied with Russia and the Warsaw Pact and the Arab nations. It will not involve the nations of the West, because the contributors to the ending of the battle will not be primarily Israel, but it rather will be the forces of God. God says that surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. The Bible uses the word great shaking to describe a massive earthquake. The Bible prophesies that this earthquake, which will be centered on the northern area of Israel in Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria, that it will devastate this combined Warsaw Pact Arab army in such a way that God says the whole world will feel the earthquake. We have just gone through a terrible earthquake that took place in the Iran area where over 40,000 people have been killed, according to recent reports. We have seen just in the last two weeks a number of earthquakes, six in number, massive earthquakes taking place. The world is seeing that it is being shaken, as God prophesied, that in the last days leading up to the second coming, there would be earthquakes in strange places in strange places that have not seen them before, and massive earthquakes are taking place, but the greatest one is yet to come. The Bible says that so the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all of the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. 
This earthquake will be felt around the world. It says the mountain shall fall down and the steep places shall fall and every wall will fall to the ground. The Bible indicates that this earthquake, while it is centered on Israel, will surround the entire world in its effects. God is literally going to grab this world by the throat and shake it. A world that is a secular humanist position has assumed that God does not exist at all as a mythological character. God is going to grab this world's attention as he did in the days of Moses. Just as in the days of Moses when the waters came around the Egyptian Pharaoh's army, there were no atheists in the Red Sea that day. There will be no atheist when this battle takes place because God will manifest himself in glory as he destroys this army whose purpose is to kill the Jewish people of Israel. The only reason for this army to come down is to devastate the Jews who have come back from every land intending to dwell peaceably. And this military invasion will take place. God says they will ascend and cover the land. I believe that Ezekiel is describing in the words that he could best use an airborne attack. And when he talks about it covering the land, we saw that in D-Day, even going back over 45 years, the clouds were literally blackened. The skies were blackened with the plains as they will come down. And God indicates, I believe, that this will happen again. He says, I will call for a sword against Russia throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. A few years ago, this was hard to understand. But today, NATO studies show that if Russia is ever losing in a battle, that in fact the Ukrainians and the, the people from Turkestan, the people from the area of Czechoslovakia and Poland will all turn upon the Soviets because they have so oppressed their peoples within this Soviet empire in the last 73 years that there is no love for those, the communist and the Russian leadership. And God describes that literally every man's sword will be against his brother. And the devastation will be complete. God says, I will plead against him, against Gog, this leader, with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Why will God do this? God says that his motive is simply this. In verse 23, it says, Thus will I magnify myself, and I will sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. When Russia and the Arab armies come to destroy the children of Israel, God will destroy those armies. And he will sanctify himself in the sight of many nations. All the nations of the world will know that it is God, the God of Abraham, that has saved Israel. Israel will also know that it is God that has saved them. Many Israelis have come back to the land in unbelief. The majority of those in Israel are not religious Jews. But there is coming a day when God will impress himself upon the world and the Jewish people as he saves them, God says in verse 2 of chapter 39, I will leave but one-sixth of thee, this is to, of the Russian Warsaw Pact army, and I will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. One-sixth will return. That means 85% of this army is going to be destroyed. God says that he'll send fire upon Magog. He'll send fire upon Russia and upon those that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. I believe with many other scholars that those that dwell carelessly in the isles will include Europe and even North America. And that as the outcome of this battle, though the Bible does not describe our nations as being devastated, it is quite conceivable that the Russians, as they are being attacked by God, would throw a few nuclear weapons our way. I believe God is going to cause the devastation of this army and he's going to grab the attention of this world. He says in verse 7 of chapter 39, So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them pollute my name anymore. Israel's come back primarily in unbelief. But today there's a rising interest in the Messiah, a rising desire, as we'll talk about in future programs, about the rebuilding of the temple. And God says that at the outcome of this battle, it will take seven years to burn the weapons for fuel. Now, people have said, how can they burn modern weapons, Grant, with steel and iron and what we use today? Do you know that Russian weapons include lignus stone, a compressed wood, super hard. It is harder than steel, and it actually will burn like coal in a furnace. God says it'll take seven months to bury the dead of that army. And it describes the valley east of Jordan 
and that is the valley in which they call it the Hamangog, the multitude of Russia. God loves the Russian and Arab people just as much as he does us. God gave his very life that you and I and all Russians and Arabs could come to know him. But God also has appointments with destiny with nations. And God says that if they come against his people Israel to destroy the land and the people, he will destroy those armies. God says that when this is, happens, he is going to set his glory in the midst of Israel. Let me read this to you. It says, after the battle's over and after the army is buried, God says during this process, he says, and I will set my glory among the heathen. All the heathen shall see my judgment that I've executed and my hand that I've laid upon them. He says, Israel will know that I am the God, their Lord God from that day and forward. He'll no longer hide his face from Israel. I believe, as I'll share in another program, that the glory that is returning to Israel following this battle is none other than the Shekinah glory of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant that has been lost for now 3,000 years. There is research that indicates that it still exists in the land of Ethiopia in an underground temple. And I'm going to be sharing with you how God describes it coming back in the last days to Israel. What an incredible time we live in and the appointments with destiny we see today. Welcome to Appointment with Destiny. I'm your host, Grant Jeffrey, and it's my pleasure to be able to ask you to join us in a research program that is going to examine Bible prophecy world history, archaeology, and the rapidly unfolding events that are leading our world toward its appointment with destiny, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Our topic today is Armageddon, appointment with destiny. Years ago, I was doing research in the Bible, and I was seeing that event after event was prophesied in the Bible that was bringing this world toward an appointment with destiny, that God said that all of human history would tend toward a final culminating battle between the forces of Satan and the forces of Jesus Christ. That battle would be over who would rule this world, who would win the battle for the souls of mankind. The Bible has not left us in doubt as to the outcome of the battle, nor as to who will be involved in the battle, what will be the end of the battle, what will happen after the battle is over? The Bible tells us that the Battle of Armageddon is the most important battle in human history because upon its determination, it will be settled who will rule the world for the next thousand years and beyond. Satan desires to destroy the souls of mankind, but Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price of death upon a cross. He paid the price of hell for those who would believe in him, that we might accept him and be saved, and that his plan for us is not that we would be appointed under the wrath of God. Paul was told in the book of Thessalonians that we, the church, the children of light, are not appointed under the wrath of God, but rather that we're appointed unto salvation. The promise of God is that this church will be taken to glory. Many of those that are believers in Christ have already gone home to be with Jesus in glory. But there is a generation that is alive today after Israel was reborn upon the nation of Israel on the mountains of Israel. God said when we saw that happen, we would know that it was nigh even at the doors. The disciples of Jesus Christ, when they finally understood that Jesus was going to be crucified, that he would not that point 2,000 years ago become the Messiah who would rule the whole world, but it, he was appointed to death upon a cross that he might atone for the sins of the world. They then walked with him out of that beautiful temple in Jerusalem. And they went up under the Mount of Olives, and as they stood there, they asked him a very significant question. They asked him a question that is recorded in Matthew 24, and they said, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? They wanted to know, Jesus, if you're going to die, and if you're going to go home to glory, if you're going to be at the right hand of your Father in heaven, when are you going to come back? Jesus Christ proceeded to tell them, 
He told them that this world has an appointment with destiny that will lead up to the final culminating battle of Armageddon. If you look with me in Isaiah chapter 40, the Bible tells us how God views this world. As we look down as the astronauts took this photograph from space looking at our world, it must have looked and reminded them of the prophecy of Isaiah that said in chapter 40, verse 15, God describes what he thinks of the world. He says, Behold, the nations are as but a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he takes up the isles as a very little thing. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. God says that the nations with all their pomp and all their warfare and all their technology, he lifts up as but the dust in the balances that he weighs. One single angel as recorded in 2 Kings destroyed 185,000 Syrian soldiers. The power of God is beyond our conception. And yet mankind in all his puny warfare has come to the point in inventing doomsday weapons of nuclear and biological and chemical weapons that we are on the point of actually becoming prepared to destroy this planet. In the book of Revelation, God says, I will destroy those that will attempt to destroy the earth. God will not let mankind destroy all mankind or even all of nature. God has a plan for the redemption of mankind. And Jesus Christ said that when he came, if he did not come and end the battle of Armageddon between the forces of the east and the forces of the west, he said no flesh would be saved at that time. Jesus Christ, in answering the question of the disciples in Matthew 24, says, First, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And so the first sign we are to look for is the rise of false prophets. And as we look at the rise of all the false eastern prophets that we see in the New Age movement today, the idol worship of rock stars, we watch people devoting their whole life to the drug culture, and we see that men are worshiping anything they can find. Whether we're looking at the Reverend Sun Moon or in the communist system where a cult of personality develops where individuals are worshipped in North Korea and also in China itself under Mao, almost as if they were gods. And yet God said all of this, false prophets would be but a sign that tells us how soon the second coming of Christ would be. He went on in verse 6 and said, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. We live in today a world where there is one military weapon for every single man, woman, and child. That is an abomination, an obscenity, that in a world that is starving to death, a world that we cannot supply the shelter for the people that are homeless upon our streets, we are spending enough money in arms that if we devoted that to hospitals, we could create a hospital for every village in the world above 3,000 people just on what the United States and Russia spend on arms today. We have so many tanks and so many armaments built up. Do you know that the Trident submarines of which we have them on the West as well as Russia has their own version in the Yankee class submarines? Each one of them has Trident submarine missiles, like our D-5 missiles, that one single submarine hiding under the ice cap could come up after a war, and that single submarine could destroy with its multiple independently targeted missiles 408 Soviet or Chinese cities. The capacity for destruction is now that we have 60,000 nuclear weapons, biological weapons and chemical weapons that are rising throughout the world. Libya with their tremendous chemical weapons plant. Iraq with the super doomsday gun capable of firing chemical and biological and even small nuclear weapons at Israel and Iran in a way that cannot be detected on this electromagnetic, electromagnetic rail gun. All of these things, God said, that we would see wars and rumors of wars. And since 1945, there have been over 300 wars. Over 30 million people have died at a time we think of as a time of peace. God said, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This is the century that has seen 
wars when the entire world has called them world wars as for the first time in history every nation had to choose a side and world war one all nations involved world war two all nations involved and today the world is divided into packs that are committed to each other's destruction the bible says all of this will end in the climactic battle between the east and the west the kings of the east with a two hundred million men army and the kings of the west led by the antichrist god says there will be famines and tragically in a world that has the agricultural ability with fertilizer to produce all the food needed we now have enough bugs killing and destroying with rodents the food and the world's grain supplies that one-third of all the food in the world is destroyed before ever reaches the mouth of a child we have a situation where in Africa famine is following war and literally millions are on the point of starvation in Africa in Ethiopia the Sudan and Central Africa God described that at such a time Jesus Christ would come first for his church and then with his church. The Bible went on and described there would be pestilence in the last days. And today we've invented all of our super drugs and billions and billions are being spent on all these super medical cures. And yet we see rising today a growth of smallpox and tuberculosis, sexually transmitted diseases without number. God said these things would happen in the last days. When we come back from this break, someone is going to share with you how you can get a hold of this material that I have done the research on showing the, how close we are to the second coming of Jesus. And then we're going to continue on with the countdown to Armageddon that God has set. Jesus Christ is coming back. That's the good news of prophecy. Have you ever wondered what heaven will be like? Heaven, the Last Frontier, explores the reality of our future life according to the tremendous prophecies of the Bible. This well-researched book answers the questions that many have asked. Will we explore the mysteries of God's vast universe throughout eternity? Will I know my friends and family in heaven? Will I have a body in heaven? Heaven, the Last Frontier will take you on an inspiring journey of discovery to a future life in heaven that will be interesting, purposeful, and joyfully real. This book also researches Israel's plans to rebuild the temple. The Bible declares that Jesus the Messiah will return to the earth in these last days to set up his kingdom. Heaven, the last frontier, will intrigue you with these tremendous discoveries. Israel has recovered the ancient text of the book of Ezekiel inscribed on marble tablets which was lost for a thousand years. Examine photos of a hidden tunnel system and secret gates underneath the temple mount. The bestseller, Heaven, The Last Frontier, will transform your understanding of prophecy and your eternal destiny. To order your copy of Heaven, The Last Frontier, please send your check for $15, including shipping, to Frontier Research, Box 470470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147, or call 800-621-9014 to order by Visa or Master Charge. Jesus said that as the world was facing its countdown to Armageddon, he said that there would be pestilence and earthquakes in strange places. Today, a tragic epidemic is spreading throughout the world. It is an epidemic called AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. With all of the medical advances in the last century, what an amazing thing it is to find that this prophecy that in the last days we would be struck by pestilence in fact is happening at a rate we have never before seen. Even in the 14th century with the Black Plague in Europe, one third of the population died, but two thirds of the people who got the Black Death, the plague, survived. Today, with over 30 different sexually transmitted diseases that are the direct result of the violation of God's law of the family, his law of sexual activity that was designed not to limit mankind but to protect mankind, we find that over 4 million American women have diseases, sexually transmitted diseases that are causing them to be unable to bear children. College-age women, 35% are now estimated in North America to have sexually transmitted diseases that are going to cause problems throughout all of their life. Today, despite penicillin and all of the bacterias and antibiotics that we have created, 
The world is facing a situation where these diseases are growing at epidemic proportions. The tragedy of AIDS is that in Central Africa, there are countries where the entire professional class is now on the point of death. In countries like Uganda, entire populations of cities, there are no people that are left alive in the government and educational because the disease of AIDS has swept through those countries as men have chosen to follow their own laws and their own inclinations rather than God's. These diseases are passing from person to person through intravenous drugs, through homosexual behavior that causes the transmission of this disease. And tragically, mankind is reaping the whirlwind from the seeds that have been sown of sin. God said this would happen in the last days, and he went on to say earthquakes in strange places. Today we're seeing earthquakes that have just occurred in Iran where over 50,000 people have died. We're watching earthquakes in Armenia take place, places that have not seen earthquakes ever before. In Iowa, over 10,000 earthquakes in the last several years, many of them so small they can't be detected except by machine. God said earthquakes would increase, and the scientists now tell us that since 1900, the amount of earthquakes above six on the Richter scale has increased by 10 times every single decade. It is an exponential growth rate that is right off the map. And God said, he described it as ever accelerating earthquakes. God said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. He then described to the Jewish people that there would be a rise of tragic anti-Semitism in the last days. And as I grew up in the time following the Holocaust to World War II, it seemed almost impossible that the world would ever turn back to that violent, sinful hatred of the Jews, the chosen people of God. And yet, tragically, we see in Russia, with the breakup of the communist system, the rise of the Pamyat movements, these memory movements of ethnic Russians, often funded by the Russian army and the KGB. A man by the name of Rasputin, who is on the executive committee that advises Mikhail Gorbachev, is the spiritual leader of the Pamyat movements. And Pamyat members have gone to Jews in Russia and said, our oath is that every one of us to prove our membership will kill a Jew. You are my Jew. Unbelievably, after the horror of the Holocaust, that this could happen, and even in Eastern Europe, as they have thrown off communism, they're looking for scapegoats. And those that were communist, rather than accept the blame of the tragedy of what communism has done, are turning and pointing to Jews and saying that the Jews are the problem, that Jews were the ones that designed the reactor at Chernobyl and all sorts of other things that are just the false accusations that the Nazis made and the Tsarist Secret Service made in Russia before the first revolution in 1917. Tragically, God said this would happen. He said, they shall deliver you to be afflicted, shall kill you, you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. In France and in Europe, even in America and Canada, we see Jewish graveyards defaced with swastikas and the rise of white Aryan supremacy groups that hate the Jews. Tragically, these prophecies are being fulfilled, and I want you to know, friend, the Bible tells us that Armageddon is on the way. We have a choice that we can either wait for Armageddon or we can accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior because he has a plan for us that involves the rapture. Our appointment with destiny is not to meet the wrath of God and the Antichrist, but it is to meet Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that as I look at these prophecies, they do not worry me. I find them fascinating. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pay, pray for the people that in light of these things, that men will turn their hearts toward home, turn their hearts back to God, I want you to know that I'm not looking for Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ because he said that in the generation that saw these things, he is going to return for his church. Even as the world searches for peace, the word Armageddon is on the lips of people from late President Reagan when he was president of the United States. When we look at other world leaders, Gorbachev uses the word Armageddon in Europe. And in the Israeli parliament, they talk about Armageddon. The Economist magazine says that the Palestinian conflict with Israel could lead to Armageddon. 
My book, Armageddon, A Point with Destiny, has now been reprinted by Bantam Books and around the world. They believe that even in the secular world, there's a tremendous interest in the topic of Armageddon, that men believe that while we are long for peace, the world is on a toboggan slide that is leading toward a disaster, that unless Jesus Christ intervenes, unless the Prince of Peace will come, the world will not find peace. Jesus went on and said in verse 14 of Matthew 24, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Today we see that the rise of the preaching of the gospel is extraordinary. If we look back in 1889, if we go back 100 years, we find that only 250 languages of the world had the gospel preached in their language. We had a period at that time where only 2,400 missionaries were around the world 100 years ago. Today we have 76,000 missionaries plus untold hundreds of thousands of national workers. And now we have a situation where over 2,400 languages now have at least some of the gospel in their language. The prophecy is being fulfilled with the electronic media, radio that is going across the world, and television as well as the printed page. The gospel is being preached, and then the end will come. The Bible went on, and Jesus Christ said, When ye therefore see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, that indicates that the temple has to be rebuilt as I have shared with you before. The Bible in Ezekiel chapter 37, 38, and 39 describes that once Israel was back in the land that Russia would lead a combined European, Russian, Arab invasion on Israel. I believe that this will be the next major event in Bible prophecy and out of this lightning attack and the monstrous earthquake that will devastate those nations, destroy the armies as God intervenes, that God will cause the Ark of the Covenant to come back to Israel. And when that occurs, that Israel will rebuild its temple, its sanctuary, that Exodus 2 will occur as Jeremiah chapter 16 and 23 tells us, that God says, I will bring my people out of the land of the north, and God will bring them into the land of Israel in the last days. Already as we speak now, hundreds of thousands of Jews are preparing to leave Russia. They are preparing to leave Ethiopia. Today, over 15,000 Jews every single month are leaving Russia, coming to Israel, exactly as God has prophesied. The prophecies continue to be fulfilled, and the Bible says that there will be a revival of the Roman Empire in Daniel chapter 2. We see Europe combining under the European economic community, and now the demand is growing for a European political union of ten nations to be united together. Step by step, the world is moving into its position on the stage of prophetic and world history to fulfill the plan of God. Europe is getting ready so that it can make a treaty with Israel for seven years led by the Antichrist. Israel is back in the land, and is this, we show you this picture of Israelis worshiping at the Western Wall with a bar mitzvah. God has caused Israelis to come back to the land. Jews that have been comfortable in America and in Russia who never dreamed of coming back are returning to the land in untold record numbers as God said, I will bring you back. He said, I'll call you from the east and from the west, but he'll bring them in massive numbers from the north. And today we see the Jews coming back in tremendous numbers in fulfillment of the prophecy. The second temple has to be built. Israelis have now done the archaeological studies. In October 19th of 1989, there was a meeting of architects, engineers, and politicians and rabbis on what it would take to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Israel must rebuild the temple in the last days. There are training 500 priests in Kohanim now. 38 of the temple vessels have been created. They have found the oil of anointing. Israel is longing for the Messiah in a way they have not in 2,000 years. The Messiah has been a topic for old rabbis, but today young men and women are dreaming about the coming of the Messiah. They are praying, Bah HaMashiach, Bah HaMashiach, come Messiah. They're praying for the rebuilding of the temple in the last days. Here we see Elise, and this is from a friend of mine who is a pastor in Jerusalem. He's 
has a church in the King of Kings Assembly in the YMCA in Jerusalem. He rents from an Orthodox rabbi who owns a condominium. In this lease, there is a vacating clause. This is the last page he allowed me to photocopy. Its vacating clause is a little different. It will tell you the kind of time we live in. It says that in the event of the coming of the Messiah, the renter will vacate the premises so that the leaseor may take possession to be there for the coming of the Messiah. God is causing Israel to return to their longing for the Messiah. There are bumper stickers in Israel now that say, we want Mashiach now. We want the Messiah now, written on the sealed eastern gate by an Orthodox Jew in paint that cannot be seen unless you come right up to it. That is a graveyard in front of it, so Jews and Hebrews, Arabs very seldom walk there in this graveyard, but written on the sealed eastern gate that Ezekiel the prophet says, when the Messiah comes from the Mount of Olives, he'll walk across the Kidron Valley, he'll go through the eastern gate into the rebuilt temple. Here written on that gate, as I'm showing in this picture, the words, Ba HaMashiach, in Hebrew, come Messiah. The invitation to the Messiah is given. Israel is getting ready for the coming of the Messiah. The Bible says that the end of Armageddon will be after the Antichrist has gone in the temple, there will be a final rebellion by Israel against him and the nations of the world. The nations of the east the kings of the east will have a 200 million man army that will come into this valley that you can see on your screen. This valley you can see as we look ahead has a V in the top of it. It's an underground airport. The, one of the largest airports in the world, a military airport. Planes literally fly right into the ground, into this underground airport, as Israel has concentrated much of its military power in the valley of Megiddo. The kings of the east with a 200 million man army will bring their army across the Euphrates. In January of this year, they dammed up the Euphrates for the first time in 2,000 years so that they can walk across dry shod. They will meet the kings led by the Antichrist in Israel in the last days. Friend, Jesus Christ is coming. He's coming first for His church. And the invitation to you is accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and He will take you home to glory, and you will return at the Battle of Armageddon to help Christ set up His eternal kingdom.